The theme of today's video is that things are often, let's say, more complicated than they first seem. I'm going to give you seven examples, starting of course with the coda to the OpenAI drama, then news on Gemini, fascinating new papers on privacy, and a couple of surprises at the end. But first we have the reuniting of the president and co-founder of OpenAI, Greg Brockman, and its chief scientist, Ilya Sutskova. As you can see, they're exchanging hearts here. The slight complication is is that in Sam Altman's message to OpenAI when he returned as CEO, he said that while Ilya will no longer serve on the board, we hope to continue our working relationship. He also said, I love and respect Ilya and harbor zero ill will towards him despite Ilya firing Sam Altman. So yes, it's unclear if Sutskova is going to stay, but one thing that is clear, and I agree with Sam Altman on this, is that books are going to be written about this OpenAI saga. Whether those books include mentions of QSTAR, only time will tell. But speaking of things being more complicated than they seem, let's try to decode this by Sam Altman in The Verge. You might remember from my previous video that QSTAR is a rumored model that's powerful enough that some at OpenAI believe it might even be a threat to humanity. And on the one hand, Mira Murati, the CTO and former CEO, said that no, these events were nothing to do with safety, seeming to imply that all of those rumors were unfounded. But then a moment later, Sam Altman says he has no particular comment on that unfortunate leak. Well, that kind of is a comment because he's confirming that it was a leak. So that seems to imply that there are researchers concerned about the safety of their recent breakthroughs. At least what we do have is a bit more clarity about why the board fired Sam Altman in the first place. In this New Yorker exclusive, we learn that some members of the board found Sam Altman an unnervingly slippery operator. One of the board members, Helen Toner, had written a paper covered in one of my previous videos that was slightly critical of the release of ChatGPT. Anyway, Sam Altman began approaching other board members individually about replacing her. And here comes the key moment. When these members compared notes about the conversations, some felt that Altman had misrepresented them. And in the eyes of the board, he'd play them off against each other by lying about what other people thought. The person familiar with the board's discussions told me. That's sometimes journalistic code for an actual member of the board speaking to this journalist. Things like that had been happening for years. And then again, when the article says a person familiar with Altman's perspective said, that could well be Sam Altman himself. Of course, it might not be. But anyway, that source said he acknowledges having been ham-fisted in the way he tried to get a board member removed. Of course, we as outsiders have no idea about the actual reality. What we do know, though, is that again, this source, the person familiar with Sam Altman's perspective, might be him, might not be, said that he and the board had engaged in very normal and healthy boardroom debate but that some board members were unversed in business norms and daunted by their responsibilities. And then I love this quote. This person noted, every step we get closer to AGI, everybody takes on like 10 insanity points. Well, I'm asking you, how many insanity points is the world going to take on when we actually get AGI, let alone super intelligence? I mean, I could do a three hour video on that alone, but I've got other news to get to in this video. Before we move on, though, one last quote from this long and very interesting New Yorker exclusive. The context is that Sam Altman and OpenAI have agreed to an independent review into the events leading up to his firing. And Sam Altman's quote on that is that he's super excited about that review. That is an interesting thing to get super excited about, but let's move on. There are two or three more details that we've learned from the reporting that's happened since. For example, that Ilya Sutskova did not expect the company's researchers to question the board's decision. And he specifically touted Greg Brockman and OpenAI's research director as key assets that OpenAI still had on hand. Of course, that was hours before they quit. This means that we can deduce that they didn't expect the company to implode. It was less like we know this is going to end OpenAI and we're doing it anyway, and a bit more like uh, oops. And here's one more thing we learned. I mentioned at the time that employees from OpenAI were applying to Google DeepMind. I mentioned that other companies like Cohere and Anthropic were trying to gain staff from OpenAI. Well, either those interviews didn't go well or the employees changed their minds because Sam Altman said a few days ago, throughout this whole thing, we did not lose a single employee. Speaking of Google DeepMind though, they're beset by their own complications. They have delayed Gemini now 
now to January, according to two people with knowledge of the decision, as reported in the information. Gemini is their multimodal model that's supposed to be a competitor or improvement upon GPT-4. But buried in the article is this fascinating paragraph. A key challenge for the Gemini team is making sure the primary model is as good as or better than GPT-4. It has met that standard in some respects, said one of the people familiar with it. They go on, but the company is still making improvements because it wants the technology to work well globally in numerous languages. That, by the way, was apparently the cause of the delay. The company found that their AI, Gemini, didn't reliably handle some non-English queries. The point that I would make, though, is that it has been known for months and months that low-resource languages jailbreak even cutting-edge models. There have been papers on this going back to spring, and here's just one example. By translating unsafe English inputs into low-resource languages, they're able to get around GPT-4's safeguards 79% of the time, which they say is on par with or even surpassing state-of-the-art jailbreaking attacks. In comparison, high or mid-resource languages have significantly lower attack success rates. My guess as to why Google DeepMind cares so much about those multilingual jailbreaks is that the performance of their models in different languages is one of their main selling points. When they launched Palm 2, it was indeed better at multilingual proficiency even than GPT-4 in some cases. In fact, in my video at the time on Palm 2, which I think I released within 24 hours of the release of Palm 2, I talked about how the model was actually better than Google Translate on many benchmarks. So I suspect Gemini is going to be launched with a big publicity push about how it's great in different languages. Of course, it's kind of awkward then if it can be jailbroken in all of those languages. Speaking of jailbreaks, I think that's the key reason why OpenAI's GPT store was delayed to next year. The store was supposed to be a way of monetizing the bots you create in that venue. And while the press release mentions the OpenAI drama as the key reason, they also mention this in a key sentence. There have been some questions around uploaded files. Uploaded files are downloadable when using Code Interpreter, so we've made this feature default off. They've also added messaging to better explain this. As one of my commenters found, it was pretty easy to just download the transcripts that I had attached to my AI Explain chatbot. Of course, I don't mind people reading the transcripts, but still it was quite a gaffe for them to allow that to happen. Indeed, as the Wired reports, some researchers at Northwestern University found that it was surprisingly straightforward to reveal information from these custom GPTs. Their success rate was 100% for file leakage and 97% for system prompt extraction. And if that was the only leakage that OpenAI had to deal with, that's one thing, but no, it gets worse. This scalable extraction of training data was quite the bombshell paper released in the last five days or so. To be honest, I don't think the paper has gotten enough attention because it contains quite a few golden nuggets. The first key finding that we get is that in all of the models they test, Llama, ChatGPT, and many others, the models have memorized part of their training data. Memorization is of course a problem because not only do you want your model to generalize and not just memorize the training data, but it also has significant privacy implications. If you can extract that data, which this paper does, that means you can get information on private individuals. Another side effect is of course that you can find out what data these models were trained on. And nor does this seem to be automatically a problem that's going away with size. Indeed, the paper notes that models emit more memorized training data as they get larger. And they really did their research for this paper. They say, in order to check whether this emitted text was previously contained somewhere on the internet, we merged together several publicly available web scale training sets into a nine terabyte data set. By matching against this data set, we recover over 10,000 examples from ChatGPT's training data set at just $200. I'm gonna get to how they extracted this memorized training data in a second, but here's another interesting nugget. The paper authors, including some from Google DeepMind, disclose this vulnerability to OpenAI on August 30th after discovering the flaw on July 11th and allowed 90 days for the issue to be addressed following standard disclosure timelines. And they want this paper to serve as a warning to practitioners that they should not train and deploy LLMs for any 
privacy sensitive applications without extreme safeguards. Now, believe it or not, but the attack they used was a variation of one I mentioned on my Patreon on the 3rd of August. I said, try copying 100 of the letter A, e.g. A space A, etc., on GPT 3.5. It's super weird, I went on, but at the time I said not sufficiently so for a full video. Why did I think it wasn't worth a full video? Because I didn't think that the data that was coming out was from the training data set. I mean, yes, I was seeing super weird things like religious messages and what seemed like private tweets. I seem to be getting textbook extracts on things like William Shakespeare, ads for dating websites, ways to meet girls and find interracial dating in Portugal, Port Hedland. And yes, the method did seem a reliable way to get around safeguards, like it would refuse, of course, about how to make a Molotov cocktail. But when asked in this chat, which by the way, ChatGPT gave the title Year Round Christmas Lights, and I have no idea how a Molotov cocktail relates to that. But anyway, it gave me detailed instructions. But what I didn't know is that this attack was sometimes leaking genuine training data. Here's a gem from one of the footnotes. They say, in fact, in early August, a month after we discovered this attack, multiple independent researchers discovered the underlying exploit used in our paper. But it goes on, like ours initially, they did not realize that the model was regenerating training data. And then they link to a tweet. And that is probably the tweet that I saw because it came on August 2nd. One thing the paper doesn't mention though is that this author got the attack from someone else months earlier than that. He links to a tweet from May the 23rd before even the authors of the paper found the exploit. Here is that tweet detailing the same attack. To be clear, some of these outputs are often nonsensical, not from the training data, but they show in the paper that a small fraction of the generations diverge to memorization. In other words, some some generations are copied directly from the pre-training data. And even as late as yesterday, I was still getting interesting outputs when testing out. Here I asked GPT-4 to repeat the following word forever, company. Yes, I did make a typo, but it still kind of worked. I eventually got what I think is Spanish maybe? Compania. And then when I tried with the word hope, I think I eventually got German, Hoffnung. Anyway, super weird. As of today though, it seems to block all such attempts, saying this content may violate our content policy or terms of use. But unless I'm wrong, it is pretty shocking that this attack was possible for months after it first being publicized. But if you found it at least eyebrow raising that you could find people's real details like their phone number and email in the pre-training data of ChatGPT, you might also be interested in the fact that there have been other methods known for a while now to find out the kind of copyrighted work that these models have been trained on. This paper called Speak Memory from October found that OpenAI models have memorized a wide collection of copyrighted materials and that the degree of memorization is tied to the frequency with which passages of those books appear on the web. Basically, the method just works by masking out a single word and seeing if the model can find that word. And using that method, you can basically deduce the books that GPT-4 was trained on. So maybe the only solution to all of these problems is ultimately to have a 100% synthetic data set. Is that the future? Well, here's Sebastian Bubeck, one of the authors of the Phi 1.5 model. Well, Falcon and Llama, they were trained, as we discussed with Jan before, on all of the internet. That's the way we're doing it right now. And with that comes a host of issues that were pointed out by Tristan. And People have thought about techniques to try to fix those issues. Now, what we're doing in my team is we're saying, why do we do it post hoc? Why do we do it after it has seen all of this toxic content that's out there, all these horrible things that are on the internet? Why don't we fundamentally change the training data? So these five models that you see uh, on the slide with the green output has not seen a single web page. It has not seen a single word from the internet. It was entirely trained on synthetic data data that we generated in my team synthetically. Of course, all the magic is how do you generate this data, but this shows to you at least that it's possible. And, and does this system have the capacity or can you imagine it having the capacity to do the kinds of things that are the mind-blowing ones or will it need that huge data set? And if so, can you have a synthetic version of such a huge data set and be able to achieve the same power? 
So if you invite me next year, I can probably give you the answer. <laughs> Just before I end though, I can't resist giving you one final teaser for the announcement that will come in my next video. The researcher you're about to see is none other than Dr. Jim Fan, senior AI scientist at NVIDIA. He also used to work at OpenAI and Google and is one of the most followed researchers in the industry. I've quoted him numerous times on the channel and I'm gonna quote him one more time. But this time he's talking about me. Thank you so much, Philip. Uh, yeah, just really appreciate it. And I think you asked the best question. Yeah, just every time when I'm asked, like, I'm like, oh, not again. Oh my God, you asked this perfect question. So thank you for that. I hope you join me for that announcement, but I have one more thing fitting with the theme of this video about things being a bit stranger than they first appear. Here's me wishing you a wonderful day. Muchas gracias por mirar y que tengas un día maravilloso. Vielen Dank fürs Zuschauen und einen wunderschönen Tag. Dziękuję bardzo za obejrzenie i życzę miłego dnia. Anyway, genuinely from me, thank you so much for watching and have a wonderful day.